waited for this day. We're gathered in your name, calling out to you. Your glory like a fire, awakening desire, will burn our hearts with truth. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're singing. Open up the heavens. We want to see you. Open up the floodgates. A mighty river flowing from your heart. Filling every part of our sing praises to you, that we could learn from your scripture, and that we could be challenged by your word. Father, I pray that as we go through this service, that you show up, and that you, you show us your glory, you show us your power, and that you teach us, you illuminate us with your word, and that you challenge us to grow according to Jesus' way. Father, I pray that you are honored by everything you see and hear in this room today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You guys may be seated. Remember when I was a baby? <laughs> Whatever I ate was what you wanted to eat. When I slept, 
was when you slept. When I woke up, you wanted to wake up too. Is it because you want to copy me? Remember when I cried because that boy didn't want to play with me? You cried too, and you weren't even there. But when I laugh, you like to laugh. Even when I have homework, you do homework. You aren't even in school, Mom. When I want to ride my bike, you always want to ride your bike even though you go kind of slow. Remember when I broke my arm? You said it broke your heart. See, we both broke something. When I get sleepy at night, you seem sleepy too. And when I get in bed, you always want to say prayers with me. And then you want to scratch my back. When you leave, you go get in your bed, too. Mom, I'm starting to think you want to be just like me because you always do things I do. But it's okay because I like it. Happy Mother's Day or Happy Mother and Son's Day in case you want to share that, too. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day to all you moms. Uh, what a wonderful day. Wonderful day to celebrate together. Uh, Craig, Clovater, and Mike, if you guys want to make your way to the front, they've got some announcements for us today. But I just want to say welcome to all of you. Uh, glad you're here today. If you are new, uh, we're really glad that you made it. Uh, we want to make sure you get some information from us. So when the service is over, if you'd make your way to the front of the sound booth, you'll see a table there with some white bags on it. Grab one of those bags. That's just information for you. We'd love to have you do that. And if everybody would do me a favor, uh, if you grabbed one of those bulletins when you came in today, uh, and the back of it, you'll see a communication card that you can tear off. Okay, it comes right off from there. Please take a moment, whether you've been here forever or this is your first time, just take a moment, fill that out, and in just a little while when we receive the offering, we'll just have you go ahead and place that in the basket at this time. Craig, go right ahead. Okay, first of all, thank you guys and a few of the women that helped out this morning doing the breakfast for the ladies of the church. Thank you very much. And then also, in two weeks from yesterday, we celebrate Bruce's life of, of life <laughs> <laughs> at Esalen Church. And we need meals, 20, feet 24 at least. If not, make whatever you desire and bring on so we can celebrate Bruce's life. Good morning. Happy Mother's Day. We have lots of mothers here. Um, I'm up here because next Saturday from 9 to 11, I'm going to be presenting some social media and safety awareness, uh, especially geared towards parents. Um, I prefer it be 18 and over because some of the topics we're going to touch on, but if you feel you want to bring your team, it's, a, it's up to you. Um, I don't want to make the decision for anybody when topics come up that you would then have to talk to them about. So that, but, I, but it's important that in our day and age um, that we be very mindful on the internet and other things. Um, for those of you who don't know me, um, Michael Phillips, I am a senior criminal intelligence analyst with the Michigan State Police. So being that, I spend most of my job, a good portion of it, dealing with social media and things like that. So not doing it on behalf of Michigan State Police, but I want to see our community safe. I want to see our church family safe. So, love to see as many of you as we can next Saturday. Very good. That's from 9, nine o'clock to 11 o'clock Saturday. So, and if you could, if you'd uh, call the church, let us know you plan on coming, that would be very, very helpful. So, uh, other than that, there's certainly other things in the bulletin for you to look at. Please do that and uh, address those things accordingly. All right, kids, you ready? Come on up. Normally, leave it on. Leave it on. Yeah. Hit, no, leave it on. Okay. 
So normally, well, we used to do a box. We're not doing a box anymore. Now we are just going to talk to the kids about what the big idea that they're learning about is. And we're going to go over the Bible verse. So today, guys, the big idea is that God gives everyone a mission. Do you guys know what a mission is? What's a mission? It, it's, a, it's like an adventure. Venture. It's like an adventure. It's a task that we need to complete. It's like doing chores. <laughs> chores could be a mission. Yeah. Da -da. Are in the army. The, the army would have missions. Um, going to space. Going to space would be a mission. A mission is a task that we need to complete, a task that we need to do, okay? God gives each one of us a task, and you are going to, a mission, and you are going to learn about that today. I really quickly want to go over the Bible verse today. Adults, you see it up here on the, on the screen. You kids do too. It's out of 2 Timothy 1.7. It says, for the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. What I really want to go really quickly with you guys, does anybody know what it means to be timid? Scared? Exactly. Exactly. It says that the spirit that God gives us does not make us afraid. No. But it gives us power. What do you think it gives us power to do? To do do the missions that God gives us. Exactly. The Holy Spirit, the spirit that God gives us, gives us the power to accomplish the mission that he gives for us to do. All right. I'm not going to go into it too much because it's kind of going to take up my lesson if I do. But I would like you all to stand up really quick. And stand up really quick. We're going to say the verse together. It's on the screen, so let's say the verse together. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. 2 Timothy 1.7. Good job. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you so much for your Holy Spirit. Thank you. You give us a task to do, but then you give us what we need to do that task because you are such a good father. We praise you and we thank you for that. Lord, I thank you for each one of these kids. I pray that you would open their eyes and open their ears, that they would hear your word. I pray that each one of them would come to know you as their Lord and Savior and surrender their will to you. Lord, I pray for each of us teachers that we would teach your word accurately and clearly and speak your truth boldly in love. Lord, fill this place with your Holy Spirit and be honored and glorified. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Yeah. You can go to class. You guys can sit down. Ooh, I missed. I missed. All right. Well, as they're heading out, let's just take a moment and talk to the Lord, shall we? Father, we are so grateful to be here this morning, Lord, to be able to come together as a family, to be able to worship together. Uh, Lord, I pray that uh, everything that comes out of our mouths um, that originates from our heart will be honoring and pleasing to you. Lord, I pray that... Uh, you know, as we just heard, Father, you've given us this spirit that is one of power. Lord, what an opportunity we have to be able to go in your power to our workplaces, to our, with our families, uh, even hanging out with friends during the week, Lord. In your power, Father, we have the opportunity to be able to share what a difference you've made in our life in hopes, Lord, that people will see that, that they will desire that that your spirit will draw them and that they will make a decision to follow you too. Certainly pray, Father, that you use us this way. Lord, I think today of uh, it is Mother's Day and 
people come at this day from so many different directions. For some, it's a day of celebration. Some, it's a day of heartache. For many, it's a day where they're missing a mom that's no longer here. Father, I pray that uh, whatever angle somebody's coming to this day, uh, Lord, I pray that you will minister to their heart. I pray, Father, that regardless of what's going on on the inside, we can look at this day as a day to honor you because you certainly have uh, created moms. (laughs) So we thank you, Father, for that. We thank you for those people in our lives maybe who um, had mother roles. And I just thank you, Lord, that you placed people in our lives to to teach us, to uh, set examples, to love us, to nurture us. Lord, we're grateful for that. Father, I pray for those uh, in our armed services today. Uh, One of those days where um, it's tough to be away from home. So, Lord, I pray that you just uh, make them aware of your presence today. Help them to do what they need to do to the best of their ability. And, Lord, I pray that uh, you'll give them a peace today. Lord, I pray for our nation. Lord, we need your direction. We need your guidance. Lord, we need to be people who will submit to your leading. So I pray, Father, that you continue to work on the hearts of the men and women in this country. Father, help draw our hearts to you. And may we have the courage to be able to make decisions based on that. Father, I pray that um, as we continue on in our worship here, Lord, by giving to you, Father, we give for so many different reasons, Lord. We, we certainly give to the organization to, to keep lights on, to keep staff on, to, to do different things, to take care of things. But, Lord, we also uh, use these resources, Father, in supporting people who are doing ministry out there to give us the opportunity to be able to do some things in ministry that we wouldn't otherwise be able to do. Lord, we do it all because we want you to be honored. We want to continue to further what you are doing. And so, Lord, as we give, we pray that indeed you'll be honored by it and that you'll give us wisdom in how to use the resources. We love you, and we just want to say thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We will receive the offering at this time, and as we do, please remember to put that communication card in the basket when it comes by. Please stand as we continue to sing praise this morning. Coming to reign, glory to Jesus, the Lamb that was slain. Life and salvation, His empire shall bring, and joy to the nations when Jesus is King. Come. Sing a song, a song declaring that we belong to Jesus. He's all we need. Lift up a heart of praise. Sing now with voices raised to Jesus. Sing to the King. For dawn of that day, we'll join in singing with all 
with voices raised to Jesus, sing to the King. For His returning, we watch and we pray. We will be ready the dawn of that day. song, a song declaring that we belong to Jesus. He's all we need. Lift up a heart of praise. Sing now with voices raised to Jesus. Sing to the King. Come, let us sing a song song declaring that we belong to Jesus. He's all we need. Lift up a heart of praise. Sing now with voices raised to Jesus. Sing to the King.
One day when heaven was filled with His praises, one day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men, my example is He. One day they led Him on Calvary's mountain, one day they nailed Him to die on a tree, suffering anguish, despised and rejected, bearing our sins, my Redeemer is He. The hand that healed nations stretched out on a tree and took the nails for me, living He loved me, dying He saved me, buried He carried my sins far away, rising He justified. glorious day one day the grave could conceal him no longer one day the stone rolled away from the door then he arose over death he had conquered now is ascended my Lord evermore. Death could not hold him, the grave could not keep him from rising again. Living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away. Rising he just freely forever one day he's coming for glorious day for glorious day glorious day one day the trumpet skies with his glory will shine wonderful day my beloved ones bring my savior jesus is sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the fact that he came down to this earth and he bore our sins on that cross and he died for us, but yet he arose again. But Father God, that mission is not done because someday he is coming back to gain the victory over this world. <clears throat> Father God, we look forward to that time and we praise you that Jesus is coming back to finish what he has started. 
And on that day that he comes back is when salvation is ours. Father, we praise you for that. And we look forward with great anticipation to the return of our king. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You guys. <clears throat> well, as we get ready today to open up God's word, we're going to be looking at the book of Matthew today. So New Testament, very first book in the New Testament. Matthew chapter 24 is where we're heading today. So you can open up your Bibles, start getting ready for that. Uh, we'll also have it up on the screen when it comes time. But as we're getting ready, uh, I was reminded, preparing for this message today, I was reminded of a story that I had heard about a woman who had made it her life's goal to outlive three husbands so she could marry four. And she was really particular about what these husbands would do for a living and in what order she would marry them. First, there was the banker. Then there was the movie star. Then there was the pastor. And then there was the funeral director. So I guess you could remember it this way better. One for the money, two for the show, three to get ready, four to go. Right? Here we go. All right. All right. Enough of that nonsense. <laughs> it's good to be prepared, right? I wouldn't recommend doing it the way she did, but it's really good to be prepared. You know, as followers of Christ, we're told a number of times in Scripture for us to be prepared, right? Be prepared, like we talked about last week, be prepared to suffer. Be prepared to, uh, well, be prepared to uh, think about Christ's return. Right? It's a big deal. And when we talk about Christ's return, we use the terms a lot of times, the end times, right? And we hear the term end times, and it does a number of things in us. Depending on where you're coming from when you hear end times, it does a number of different things. One, it could be anxiety. Maybe you've heard enough or you've read enough or you've seen enough of Hollywood's version of the end times that uh, it fascinates you, but at the same time, it, it scares you to death. Some pretty wild stuff out there. Or maybe you just have apathy. You're going, you know, it's pretty interesting. It's pretty fascinating to talk about, but I really don't see what it has to do with me today. Or you're somebody who just has anticipation. As a believer, you might be able to look past all the stuff and just realize the fact of Jesus is indeed coming back someday again. And when he does... We're going to receive this glorified body, and we're going to be able to join him and spend eternity with him. You're in one of those three classes. And my goal through this study in the next few weeks is to help those of you who are indifferent to become inspired. And for those of you who live in fear, to, to switch over to living in anticipation. In order to move forward with a study like this, though, we need to establish some guidelines that will help us navigate what it is that we're trying to accomplish them. We'll call them warning signs. Here's the first one. First warning sign is don't let the details cause you to lose the delight. See, this is going to be a survey level dive into the end times. It's not going to be a deep dive where I'm going to explain all of the symbols and so everybody understands all of the symbols that they read in like Revelation and in Daniel. Why? Why are we not going to go that deep, Pastor? Well, I'm going to try to explain it this way. I've got three pictures that I'd like to show up on the screen and I would like you to help me to identify what they are. So here's the first one. What is it? Yeah, good for you. Good job. How about the next one? Show it. Hey, you are two for two, man. Rock it. All right. And the third one. There you are. See? Now, some of you got it. A lot of you are like, oh, it could be this, it could be that, right? What's the point? Don't lose personal responsibility in the midst of historical and theological curiosity. 
See, we can get so wrapped up in the details, studying the details, that we lose sight of the, the big picture. And so what I'm hoping is in the midst of your discovery of the end times that you remember to look for how you can apply what you're learning to your life to today. You know, any study of prophecy is pointless if we don't allow it to move us to become more like Christ in the way that we live. So as we read, we need to ask ourselves three questions. These questions are not up on the screen, but you do have space in your notes, A, B, and C. Here we go. So ask yourself these questions. First one, A, what did the Bible passage mean to the original hearers? To the people it was written to in the first place. What did it mean to them? Now, this is an important principle, even more so when we're reading the end times, because much of the prophecy of the second coming of Christ is what is known as apocalyptic literature. Okay, apocalyptic means to unveil or to reveal. And it often reveals a thing or something that is a truth that is clear for some people to understand while it's not so clear for other people to understand. A lot of symbolism that we might find confusing was perfectly understandable to people of the day when it was written to them. Here's an example of something today that we can look at. Right? Leave it up there. Now, we understand this picture, right? We look at that and go, we're being spoon-fed by the media. A hundred years ago, they wouldn't know what that is, right? And it's quite possible that technology will advance so far in the next hundred years that they might not understand that either. Today, in the day and age we live in, we get it, right? Understand that... Things about the end times were written. Some people would understand them of the day. Some people would not. Comedian Tim Hawkins. Kind of, I don't know if you've ever watched Tim Hawkins or not, but in order to try to emphasize this point, one day he was in his comedy bit, was talking about writing something and was, you know, doing this number, I guess, and then he goes like that. And he comments. Right now, he said, there's a whole generation that are wondering, why did he hit the side of the computer? Right? Right? And maybe you're sitting here today. You might even be of of that generation where you're going, I don't get it. What's so funny? Right? But those of us who had manual typewriters and who can remember the return, you know, we get it. That's the difference. Symbolism in different times means and is understood in different ways by people. We have to read Scripture through the lens of those who it was written to, even though it can be applied today. So the first thing, we've got to ask, you know, what did it mean to those who heard it originally? Second thing, B, is what is the underlying timeless principle? What is the underlying timeless principle? What are they trying to teach us? Well, in this case, the message of the second coming of Jesus is real simple. It's hope. The scriptures concerning Jesus' second coming is not only does it talk about hope for the believers living at the time, but it's hope for all of us who are living today, who are believers. Many of the prophecies in books like Daniel and Revelation have yet to be fulfilled. So we can still look forward to them with great hope. Hope when you hear it, hope when you look forward to it. And then see... Where or how can I practice this principle? Right? Here's the application. Where or how can I practice this principle? This is the main point of God revealing words to us in Scripture in the first place. He wants us to be able to read it, to learn from it, and to ask ourselves, how can I put it into practice? We read in 1 John. It says, I have written this to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know you have eternal life. Notice who it was written to and to why it was written. It was written to those who are able to understand it so that they can have assurance of their salvation. 
That's the point. If your goal in studying the end times is going to be merely to understand symbols and to try to establish timetables rather than to ask yourself, how can this make a difference in my life so that I can live more like Christ today, then you're missing the point. Be better off you didn't even bother reading it. The details are fascinating, but they are not the point. Don't get lost in the details. We need to keep our eyes focused on the point. Hope as we study the end times. Let me get warning number three. Watch out for polarization in teaching about the second coming. All right, this warning is perhaps my biggest hesitation in teaching on this subject. We live in very polarizing times today. Everything seems to divide us. We get cemented in our viewpoints, in our ways of thinking, and we ostracize those who don't think the way that we do or believe the way that we do. See, that shouldn't be the case, particularly amongst those who of Ecclesia, right, share a common faith. In fact, we're warned. Paul is talking to young Timothy He says, don't get involved in foolish, ignorant arguments that only start fights. A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but must be kind to everyone. See, much of what is revealed to us regarding the end times has multiple possibilities to it. You need to understand that going in. So no matter what your position is on some things, you need to understand that there's multiple possibilities positions on those things, and in many cases, those things are able to be proved from Scripture as well. So you need to be prepared for that. Now, personally, I'm a guy who likes to teach, this is what Scripture says, that's just the way it is, right? So the ambiguity of it, that that bothers me. That bothers me. I don't want to confuse people, and studies of the end times can be confusing, particularly if you focus on the details rather than the big picture. The other problem that seems to surface when focusing on the details is that we tend to morph into becoming prophets, right? We read our details. We think we understand a particular symbol or sign, and and we've we've been given some divine insight. So we go out and we boldly proclaim the meaning of that particular thing. We boldly proclaim who or what it's talking about, often in error. You know, there was a day and time when people who were studying these things were convinced that Adolf Hitler was the Antichrist. And then he died. And it became obvious that that wasn't true. My hope is that as we talk about details, you don't get so lost in the details that you lose the wonder, that you lose the delight, that you lose focus of the hope that the message is talking about. And we're going to continue to try to remind you of the hope as we move along. But signs are important. Jesus says they are important for us to pay attention to. We read in Matthew 24, it says, Now learn a lesson from the fig tree. Its branches bud and its leaves begin to sprout. When it does, you know that summer is near. In the same way, when you see all these things, you can know his return is very near, right at the door. However, 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 make sure we get this. No one knows the day or the hour when these things will happen, not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself. Only the Father knows. So when you start hearing people telling you this is when the world's going to end, just, you know, la, 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 do that, right? They don't know. God wants us to pay attention to signs. He wants us to learn from them. They do give us some ideas of some things, some timing, ideas. Not exact. We need to know that. He's only going to reveal to us what is in his word, what he wants us to learn. That's all he wants us to really have to worry about knowing. We're not going to know exact dates. So let's dig into it, shall we? Looking at Matthew 24, let's begin with verse 1. 
As Jesus was leaving the temple grounds, his disciples pointed out to him the various temple buildings. But he responded, do you see all these buildings? I tell you the truth, they'll be completely demolished. Not one stone will be left on top of another. See what's happening. Now in the book of Luke, it says that the disciples were enthralled with the majestic stonework. All the beautiful decorations, memorial decorations that were in the temple. Much like the way that you and I can become enthralled when we see other church buildings and see, you know, all of the the decorations, all of the masterpiece work, you know. If you ever walk into a place that has some really beautiful woodwork, you know, and you just notice it and you admire it. And Jesus is trying to slam the door right away. He's going, look, man, look at them. Enjoy the beauty of it. But don't oversell their significance. They're going to be destroyed, all of it. See, there's more important things to be thinking about, he's saying. The end is coming. We need to be prepared for it. Let's keep reading. Verse 3. Later, Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives, and his disciples came to him privately and said, Tell us, when will all this happen? What sign will signal your return at the end of the world? Man, they were asking the same questions back then that we're asking today. Jesus told them, don't let anyone mislead you, for many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah. They will deceive many, and you will hear of wars and threats of wars, but don't panic. Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. Nation will go against war against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world. But all of this is only the first of the birth pains with more to come. See, Jesus is speaking of signs. He's speaking of things that we will see. And he says that they're signs that they're like the beginnings of birth pains. All right, it's Mother's Day, right? And I know we're supposed to be focusing on all the good stuff of Mother's Day And here we read stuff about birth pains. And, you know, I'm sorry to bring that back up, right? We know about birth pains. What do we know about birth pains? They hurt. And they increase. They get worse. We have to remember who this was originally written to, right? The birth pains get worse. But in the end, they produce something wonderful. Some of these signs have been around since Jesus was preparing to ascend to heaven and and then ascended. These signs have been around that long as reminders to to everyone of things that are happening now and, and, you know, things that are coming in the future. What are they? Well, false Christs was the first thing he says. There'll be false Christs. These are people who Jesus says will claim to be the Messiah, and they will deceive many. I can think of three. I was trying to think of this the other day. I could think of three already in my lifetime. Uh, the Reverend Jim Jones, right? You might remember that name. Uh, you got David Koresh, okay? You remember that? Who both led their mass followers to their death. And then I went back a little further, uh, Charles Manson. Right? Charles Manson led his people to go and kill other people. There'll be false Christs claiming to be the Messiah. There'll be wars and threats of war. If the war and the threats of war aren't here in America, they're somewhere around the world. There's always, I mean, right now, right? We got Soviets and the Ukraine. I would certainly think of more. Earthquakes and famine. They remind us that God's perfect creation has been tainted and therefore it's going to experience some natural consequences. See, these are signs that point us to the end. And they're signs that will eventually come together and will be summed up in the end. Revelation 6 says, When the Lamb broke the third seal, I heard the third living being say, Come, come. I looked up and saw a black horse, and its rider was holding a paid, uh, a scale, uh, scales in his hand. And I heard a voice from among the four living beings saying, A loaf of wheat bread or three loaves of barley will cost a day's pay. And don't waste the olive oil and the wine. And you thought inflation was bad now, right? 
Paul writes in 2 Thessalonians, the man of lawlessness will be revealed. But the Lord Jesus will slay him with the breath of his mouth and destroy him by the splendor of his coming. This man will come to do the work of Satan with counterfeit power and signs and miracles. Get it? You read that? Counterfeit. So every time you see miracles and signs and wonders, don't all of a sudden jump to the assumption that here it is, this is from God. Because Satan, above all else, is a deceiver. Scripture tells us he masquerades as an angel of light. And it's no wonder that his demons masquerade as angels of light. Don't buy everything you see. Scripture tells us to test the spirits. Then we read in Revelation 19 again, I saw the beast. Oh, I'm sorry, let me continue reading. He'll use every kind of deception to fool those on their way to destruction because they refuse to love and accept the truth that would save them. They were deceived because they refused to accept the love. Then in Revelation 19, I saw the beast and the kings of the world and their armies gathered together to fight against the one sitting on the horse and his army. And the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who did mighty miracles on behalf of the beast. Miracles that derived or that deceived all who had accepted the mark of the beast and who worshipped his statue. Both the beast and his false prophet were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. Their entire army was killed by the sharp sword that came from the mouth of the one riding the white horse. Wow, crazy stuff, man. Where's the hope? First of all, it says those who will be deceived are those who refused to accept the truth, which means believers don't have to worry about that. There's hope in that. And it says that Jesus destroys them all, right? He totally conquers evil when he returns. As scary as things might seem at times, we have no reason to fear. He's coming back, and it's going to be a glorious day. But these are just signs pointing us to the end. Then there are signs that immediately precede the end. You know, we have a countdown clock at the beginning of our service. Right, Proceed, just immediately preceding our service. And when it gets down to zero, you know the start of the service is pretty near. And so that's what some of the signs in Scripture point to. They let us know that Jesus' return is real close. Then we get signs that are, like I say, preceding, like just right at the beginning of things, they're preceding the end. Let's keep reading. Verse 9. Then you'll be arrested, persecuted, and killed. You'll be hated all over the world because you're my followers. And many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and will deceive many people. Sin will be rampant everywhere, and the love of many will grow cold. It's a fancy word here. It's called apostasy. It means to, uh, to abandon or renunciate your belief. Say, you know what, I believe that once, but I don't believe that anymore. People are going to claim, you've heard it probably, that people are going to claim that, hey, I believed in God at one point in time or I believed in Jesus, but I no longer do. We've seen that in our day, no doubt. And though it's easy to see it that way, Paul says it will also worm its way into our churches. He says, the time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. I really try hard not to think about the fact that there's churches meeting today where the truth won't be told. Where people will appeal to what the masses want to hear to make them feel good so they can walk out the door and have their itching ears tickled. I got to be honest with you folks. I'd, I'd much rather be standing here talking to an empty room than to compromise the truth. But it's happening, 
and it's going to continue to happen. And people are going to mobilize and rally around those who will just make them feel good. People will become religious consumers, fixated on how things make them feel and what they want, regardless of whether or not those things conflict with Scripture. Yeah, we're definitely seeing that one too. Then we're told that sin, sin will be rampant and love will grow cold. Again, Paul writes, in the last days there will be very difficult times for people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends. They will be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. And then he warns, stay away from people like that. In the end times people will turn away from the faith. People will make fun of the faith. And people will make fun of those who adhere to the faith. Evil will increase. False teachers will become very, very popular. And love will be a word with diminishing value in practice. Even in the church. So where's the hope? Verse 13. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all the nations will hear it. And then the end will come. Those who endure to the end will be saved. And the gospel is going to be preached to every nation. Every nation is going to hear the gospel. So when you hear people say, well, what about those people in that far away, unreached group, you know, I haven't heard. The way I read it is before the end comes, there won't be such a people. Everybody will have heard and therefore will have had the opportunity to respond to the message of God's grace. So, there's signs that point us to the end. There's signs that immediately precede the end. And then there are signs that say the end is happening right now. Now, we're going to begin talking about those next week. So, I hope you come back to hear that. There's pain right now, and it seems to be increasing. But there's hope. There's something wonderful being produced. Don't ever lose sight of that. Don't ever lose sight of that. Got to stand firm on God's word as the truth and as the source of our hope as this world starts making its way to its conclusion. Rely on the truth and let it bring you hope. Don't lose the delight in the details. You know, it's always been about hope, really. Uh, in creating this earth, we're told in Scripture, we know of God's foreknowledge. And it says that even before the creation of the world, He prepared a Savior for us, knowing that we would need one. So that you and I, as people, as sinners, uh, we recognize our need for God's grace, and then we recognize the hope that we can have because of Jesus Christ. God so loved this world that he sent his only son to die in, in place of you and I, to die 
to pay the price of our sins. So that for all of us who would believe that and accept that, right, we could be saved. That's great hope, man. That's something to celebrate. And so we do. He has created this meal of remembrance. A very simple meal, but extremely significant. He met with his disciples, and he wanted them to remember what he was about to do. He wanted all of us to remember what he has done. And so he creates, as we talk about symbols, he creates this symbolic meal so that we would never forget. I invite anyone here today who has accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord, as their Savior, to join us in this meal because it is indeed a family meal. We will first pass out the bread, ask everybody to take one and hold on to it, and then we will all eat that together, and then we'll do the same with the juice as it's passed around. Come, for now all things are ready. So in gathering with his disciples to give them something to remember what he was about to do, Jesus took bread, and he broke it, and he gave thanks for it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. As often as you eat it, do so, remembering me. The cup that we share represents the blood of Christ shed for you and me. In the same way that he had with the bread, Jesus took the cup gave thanks for it, and he said, this is my blood, which is poured out for you. As often as you drink it, do so remembering me. Father, we celebrate today. In this meal of remembrance, we celebrate your first coming. When you came here to to die in our place, We celebrate that that wasn't the end of that story, but that you resurrected from the dead, conquering death. And you've returned to be with the Father. But Lord, we know that you're coming back again, that you're going to conquer evil once and for all, that you're going to take those of us who know you, who've trusted you with our lives, you're going to take us up with you to give us glorified bodies, to be able to spend forever in your presence. And we look forward to it with great anticipation. Thank you for the reminder today. In Jesus' name, amen. As we go ahead and close this service out, I want to go ahead and read um, some, some words that Paul wrote in his letter to the church in Thessalonica. And this is what it says. It says, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God. First, the believers who have died will rise from their graves. Then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. So encourage each other with these words. You know, we can look forward to God's return, Jesus' return as he comes on those clouds with great anticipation because after that moment, then we will be with the Lord forever. With that in mind, I want to go ahead and stand and celebrate and praise uh, in, in anticipation of the Lord's return. are the days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days of your servant, Moses, righteousness being restored. And though these are days of great trials, of famine and darkness and sword, still we are the voice in the day. Crying, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Behold, He comes, riding on the clouds, shining.
like the sun at the trumpet call lift your voice it's a year of jubilee out of zion till salvation comes and these are the days of ezekiel the dry bones becoming as flesh. And these are the days of your servant, David, rebuilding a temple of praise. And these are the days of the harvest. The fields are wide in the world. And we are the laborers in your vineyard, declaring the world of the Lord. Behold, He comes riding on the clouds, shining like the sun at the trumpet call. Lift your voice, it's the year of jubilee, not a science hill, salvation There is no God like Jehovah. 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 Holy God, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. to look forward to, isn't it? But I got to be honest with you, we just set the table today and kind of gave a few appetizers, right? So next week we eat. Look around the room. Look for those that you maybe normally see that you don't. Call them. Tell them you miss them. Invite them to come back with you for dinner next week. And we're going to eat. A lot to look forward to. It's a great day. Great day. I hope you enjoy your celebration today with moms. I hope you enjoy your week as a believer in Christ, looking forward to when he returns with great anticipation. Go in peace. And may the God of love and peace go with you now and forevermore. Amen. Have a great week.